My name is Keith Williams. I was a 2003 Jeopardy! College champion, and I'd like to walk you through one of the most important, yet most frequently overlooked aspects of the game. The final wager. So why is wagering strategy so important? Well, if you think about it, it might be the only aspect of the game you actually control. You can't do anything about what goes on the board, or how fast your opponents are on the buzzer, or who finds the daily doubles. You might be the world's best Jeopardy player, but at some point you're going to find yourself in a tight game, so you have to know what to do. Let's look at an example. Here Tim has 14,200, Liz has 11,000, and Jason has 7,600. By the end of this series, you'll be able to calculate that Tim should wager at least 7,800, Liz between 4,200 and 4,600, and Jason no more than 800. So where do we begin? Think about something else that's complicated. Let's say you're planning for a wedding. You don't just throw everything in the air and hope it all works out. In the end, you say, all right, today I'm going to look at an event space, and next week I'm going to look for catering, and the week after that, I'm going to find a DJ. You break it down into its component parts, and it's more manageable that way, and that's exactly what we're going to do here. The key to wagering is not to look at all three players at once, but to look at just two at a time. Let's forget about Jason for now, and look at just Tim and Liz. Now we can calculate their wagers in three easy steps. The leader always wagers so that if he's right, he'll win, no matter what anyone else does. What's the most Liz can have? If she wagers everything and gives a correct response, she'll have 22,000. Tim needs to have at least that to win the game, a minimum wager of 7,800. So why 7,800 instead of 7,801? Let's return to a concept I touched on briefly in my last post, something so important I'll call it rule number zero. Your only goal is to come back the next day. In regular play, you can do this by winning or by tying. Strictly in terms of game theory, wagering to tie is better than wagering to win. It will have the same effect if you're right, but it might save you if you're wrong. We'll discuss this in greater detail in a separate installment. So now that we know what Tim needs to do, let's turn to Liz. If you're trailing, you can't assume the leader will wager the tie. Focus instead on what he'll have if he gets it wrong, and aim to have at least that. If Tim is wrong, he'll have at most 6,400. Liz will need to have at least this total to return the next day. She does some subtraction. 11,000 minus 6,400 is 4,600. So Liz can wager at most 4,600. Now there's one more rule we need to look at. You want to wager so you're at least tied with the other player, should he wager zero. Now by if safe, I mean only do this if it doesn't violate any other rule. Let's start with Tim. If Liz wagers zero, she'll have 11,000. So that he doesn't fall below 11,000 if he gets it wrong, he can wager no more than 3,200. But since he already has to wager at least 7,800 from rule number one, we'll ignore this. Now for Liz. If Tim wagers zero, he'll have 14,200. To match this total, Liz will need to wager at least 3,200. This works with her maximum wager of 4,600 from rule number two. So against Tim, Liz needs to wager at least 3,200, but no more than 4,600. That's it. When only two players are involved, wagering is usually as easy as one, two, three. Now how about some practice? Here we have Amanda with 15,800 and Bob with 10,600. We begin with Amanda. If Bob wagers everything, he'll have 21,200. Amanda would need to have at least this to guarantee a victory. Do some subtraction, and Amanda has to wager at least 5,400. Now for Bob. If Amanda gets it wrong, she'll have 10,400. So Bob wants to stay above this total. That means he can wager no more than 200. Now for rule number three, and we'll start with Amanda. If Bob wagers zero, 
he'll have 10,600. So for Amanda to stay above that total, she can wager no more than 5,200. But you'll notice that she's already committed to wagering at least 5,400. So this doesn't work. Now for Bob. If Amanda wagers zero, she'll have 15,800. So to match this total, Bob would need to wager at least 5,200. But he can wager no more than 200 from rule number two, therefore this wager doesn't work either. Now for another example. Here we have Dan with 21,000 and Emily with 12,400. We start with Dan. If Emily wagers everything and gets it right, she'll have 24,800. To match this total, Dan will need to wager at least 3,800. Now for Emily. If Dan gets it wrong and wagers 3,800, he'll have 17,200. To match this, Emily will need to get it right and wager at least 4,800. We move on to rule number three. If Emily wagers zero, she'll have 12,400. Dan would need to wager at most 8,600 to match this total. That means he can wager up to 8,600. Now for Emily. If Dan wagers zero, he'll have 21,000. To match his total, Emily will need to get it right and wager at least 8,600. In this two-player game, that works with her original wager, so she should wager at least 8,600. So let's look at the rules one more time. The goal of Jeopardy is to come back the next day. You can do this either by winning or by tying. The leader always wagers to take her destiny into her own hands. So if she gets it right, she comes back the next day. The trailer positions himself to win if the leader gets it wrong. And only if it doesn't violate any other betting rule, each player covers a zero wager by the other. That's it for part one. In part two, we'll look at some special scenarios for two players before adding back in the third player to calculate the final wager. See you then. slurring an example. You want me to jump in with, can we see an example? <laughs>